always on the cutting edge of high quality care, Catholic Health Services has expanded its women's services, now offering surgical and non-surgical treatment for women with pelvic floor disorders, which the National Institutes of Health estimates 25% of U.S. adult women suffer from. But that's not all. We'll also discuss heart disease in women and what you should know about it. Learn more on today's episode of CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jane Hansen. Today's conversation, women's health. Pelvic organ prolapse occurs when tissue and muscles can no longer support the pelvic organs. This happens when the pelvic organs, like the uterus, bladder, or bowel, collapse into the vagina. Symptoms can come on gradually and may not be noticed at first, but a healthcare professional may discover a prolapse during a physical exam. If you have symptoms and they interfere with normal activities, you may need treatment. The goal of reconstructive surgery is to restore organs to their original position. And to tell us more about all of this is Dr. Keith T. Downing, Chief Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery for Catholic Health Services. Welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Especially. I was surprised at that statistic that 25% of female adults in the U.S. actually have this. Pelvic floor disorders are common problems. You know, we see problems with urinary incontinence, problems with prolapse are very common. And so, um, yeah, it's one of those things that uh, many women will experience. And depending on the extent of their symptoms, the nature of their symptoms, uh, you know, will determine in terms of how much bother they may have or have not. Or, or how much treatment they may need is what you're really saying. Yeah, exactly. So what exactly is it? So you, you, the description in the lead-in was, was, was excellent. Um, I think of it as a bit of like a hernia, right, where the support to the vaginal walls have weakened such that the bladder, uh, the bowels, or the uterus can kind of bulge into the vagina to the opening or perhaps beyond. Um, the analogy I like to use is thinking of the vagina like a room, right? What's happening to the, the roof? What's happening to the floor? Or if you're walking into a room, what's happening to the far wall? Is that roof... Um, you know, sagging down and coming to the opening? Is the floor buckling out or is that far wall coming towards the opening? Well, so if we're talking about that, you know, that happening, it doesn't yeah. always need surgery. I guess actually I should start with what causes it? Yeah, um, so the common risk factors are having been pregnant and particularly having vaginal deliveries. Mm -hmm. um, and we do think having more deliveries is it increases one, one's risk. Um, aging is another big risk oh, factor. Oh, great. So you're hitting all the good points here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, as we get older, our, our muscles weaken, our mm -hmm. tissues uh, become less, uh, lose, lose their strength, and so that contributes as well. Uh, when women go through menopause, they lose estrogen. That also affects the tissues and the strength and support the tissues can provide. Um, women who have conditions that result in increased intra-abdominal pressure, so chronic constipation, um, it may be something like... Uh, COPD or emphysema, uh, or it may be the nature of their work where they're doing a lot of heavy lifting over long periods of time. Mm -hmm. All that can contribute to the onset of prolapse. Can exercise, too much exercise cause it? We don't necessarily think so, too much exercise. Uh, generally, you know, there are a lot of reasons to, to exercise and exercise regularly, and we don't want to, you know, interfere, don't interfere with that. With that. No, nope, because no, no. <laughs> we like that when people exercise. But yeah. how do you really know when you have it? Because you say that, because, you know, the symptoms come on over time, right? Um, and how do you know when you actually need to deal with it? Right, right. Well, symptoms can range from really being asymptomatic. I have many women who referred to me because they were told by their gynecologist that their, you know, their bladder was low, that there was some prolapse present, um, but they didn't really know or notice anything or feel anything themselves. Mm -hmm. um, other women may be having pressure or, or bulge sensation. They may feel or see something that's there coming out past the opening of the vagina. Um, some women may begin to have problems with moving their bowels or emptying their bladder or interfering with the sexual activity. Um, so the symptoms can range quite a bit. So once you determine that you have this, though, then what is yeah. the treatment? 
Right. Well, I think first thing that I want to try and understand um, when the patient comes to the office is kind of the extent and nature of their prolapse. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the different, you know, the roof of the vagina, the floor of the vagina, and the far wall. So I want to understand kind of what compartments are, are being affected, you know, one, two, or all three, or some combination thereof. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, the other is what impact it's having on, on their life and on their quality of life, you know. So I think in terms of thinking about what we want to do, the patient themselves is really going to determine that in many ways by the extent of the bother that they're having. Sure, like how much is it interfering with their normal life? And right. if it is, then right. what? Right. Surgery? Well, so there's a range of, of options. So one is saying, listen, um, you know, we can work on strengthening your pelvic floor muscles, and that may not uh, reverse all of the prolapse that's there, but it may help things stay in more so mm -hmm. that you are less symptomatic. And for some women, that may be enough, you know. For other women, we can use something called a pessary. Uh, pessaries are devices, most are kind of circular or disc shaped, that we can place in the vagina, support the prolapse. A pessary has to be big enough to stay in, small enough that a woman should feel it, which is quite important. And they can use that pessary to manage their prolapse and they can do that indefinitely. Um, patients who are using a pessary often come back to the office every three months. They don't have to do anything with it. They can leave it be, leave it in place. We'll take it out, clean it, make sure it's not irritating the walls of the vagina. Um, or certain pessaries a woman can take out and put in on their own, and then they come see us less frequently. Um, if so, those, wait a minute. Yeah. so with that, that's something that you, will you have to have that indefinitely for a long period of time, or... Uh, how does yeah. that work? Yeah. Um, women who choose to use a pessary can use it, can use it indefinitely, absolutely. Um, some women, we use it in anticipation of surgery, so they have some relief, but ultimately they want to go on to surgery. Other women will use it for as long as they, you know, it's working for them. Mm -hmm. you know? Does it help, can, does it help restore anything? No. Unfortunately, no. Mm -hmm. you know, we, if you take it out, then you can anticipate the prolapse re returning. Okay. You know? yeah. So, beyond that, yeah. when, when you finally decide Surgery is necessary. Right, right. So uh, we have a, a number of different options of treating prolapse surgically. Um, I think the most important thing is that we can offer minimally invasive ways of treating one's prolapse, and that can be the kind of original minimally invasive surgery, operating through the vagina, or it can be operating laparoscopically, you know, operating through small incisions in the abdomen, one to two centimeter incisions, and treating one's prolapse that way. But what do you do? So usually we're, we're, we're trying to lift and support the walls of the vagina. Um, when we're operating vaginally, we're usually doing that uh, using one's own tissue and suture. Um, when we're operating laparoscopically, we do use, often use um, mesh material to help support the walls of the vagina. So there's mesh that's actually put in? Yeah, right. So we use mesh material, um, you know, brought in through our trocars, placed it into the abdomen. They're then secured to the walls of the vagina, the anterior wall, the roof, or the, and the posterior wall, the floor mm -hmm. of the vagina, with suture. And then we, with that mesh, we then elevate the vaginal vault, and we can secure it to the tailbone that keeps things elevated. And that, we think, is really the most durable way of treating prolapse. Right. And does that last forever? Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, one of the challenges of prolapse surgery is no matter kind of who's doing it, where it's getting done, prolapse can potentially recur. Really? I think, I think any woman having surgery needs to kind of be aware of that. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to come back to the same extent or the same involved compartment may, you know, prolapse again, um, but that is something a woman needs to be aware of. Um, but that said, still the majority of women, once treated surgically, are not going to need uh, treatment again. And when you, uh, just, I guess, is there any way to prevent it? We don't have any good ways of preventing it. I mean, if we go back to the primary risk factors, you know, pregnancy and aging, right, these are things that are going to happen to Not going to give up yeah. having kids. You can't <laughs> right. do much about that aging thing. Right. So, we, you know, you know, there's a question always of, if I do enough Kegels, will that prevent the onset of prolapse? You know, right now, we don't have any, any great way of preventing it from, from occurring. But it can't hurt. Right. Kegels definitely can hurt. We talked about exercise. Exercise for the pelvic floor is uh, doing Kegels. And so, you know, you can do those as much as you can, uh, and that should, you know, be a benefit and shouldn't cause any harm. And are there any side effects of doing this mesh thing? I think when we operate with mesh, when we operate abdominally with mesh, um, our, our big concern, you know, you, in most, the majority of women, their bodies are going to tolerate it just fine. They're not going to have any bad reaction to it. Um, the complication we were most about is if I were the, to subsequently examine you, you know, look at the vaginal walls, if I could see or feel a small area of mesh material in the vagina, what we call mesh erosion or exposure. Oh, 
All right. Um, if that happens, you may not know it at all. In the absence of being examined, you could have some discharge um, or a little bleeding from that area. That's something we can fix in the office often, mm -hmm. or sometimes it may be a trip back to the operating room, and it's a, usually a very easy fix. But it should, doesn't yeah. take long, and I, I know no, that um, we've talked about this seven-minute mesh operation at times, too, in the past. So Yeah, that's often a, a procedure we use to treat stress incontinence. When you leak urine, when you cough, laugh, or sneeze, oh, that's yeah. another common area where we use mesh material as well. Got it. Well, thank you very much. We're going to take a quick break. Don't go anywhere because we're going to stick around for the end of the show. Coming up, we're going to talk about women and heart disease. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for women in the United States. One in every four females die from it every year. Almost two-thirds of women who die suddenly of coronary heart disease have no prior symptoms. And even if you do not have symptoms, you still may be at risk. To speak more about this is an expert in women's heart disease and diagnostic cardiac imaging. Dr. Abni Thakur, Chief Medical Officer, CHS Medical Group, joins us now. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jane, for having me. For decades, I've reported about heart disease being a leading cause of death for women, and yet it never seems that the statistics get any better despite all of the warnings. Why is that? It's a major problem for women. Um, I think one of the main issues that we face is awareness um, in the female population in the United States. So we still think about cardiac disease as a man's problem. Um, the AHA, American Heart Association, and many other groups have done a lot of work and really good work over the years to start increasing awareness of heart disease in women, but it's still not seen by most women to be a prevalent cardiac, a prevalent health issue for them. But I understand that. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem is that the symptoms that we have are so different than what men have. That has a lot to do with it. Diagnosing heart disease in women um, is more complicated sometimes. Uh, women um, and women's hearts in particular can be more complicated than men's hearts. So, well, in many ways. <laughs> and in many ways, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure you'd agree. So I think what you find with men is more often than not, you'll find more classic symptoms as their presentation. A man will often say, you know, I had chest pain on the left side of my chest. Sometimes they'll make this type of emotion. Um, the symptoms in women, and I take care of a lot of women patients who eventually get referred to me for cardiac disease, the symptoms can be more vague. They can present as lightheadedness, um, a hot flash they sometimes think it is. Uh, they might have some atypical sounding chest pain. It's not really on the left side. It might be a little bit over here. Maybe it's indigestion. So they might think it's heartburn. Oftentimes it's just feeling more fatigued than their norm. So the symptoms can be a little more vague, and I think diagnosing it therefore becomes more challenging. So when you talk about not having a lot of symptoms, what's the remedy then? Is it that every woman should be required to have certain kinds of heart tests every year? I mean, what do you do about it? Because we want to find out and we don't want these statistics to continue as they are. No, absolutely not. And I think the most important thing for women, first and foremost, and I say this to my family members, my friends, and my patients, is to start to prioritize their own health. Just basic prioritization of your own health. Uh, women typically have so many things pulling at them in life. You know, you have children, you have family members. You, many women work now. It's pretty normal for women to work and have busy lives where they're balancing a lot of different things. Um, and so health often doesn't fall at the top of that list. Um, and the most important way you can improve your chances when it comes to heart disease is early diagnosis of your risk factors. And usually that happens at a routine physical examination. So what are our risk factors? The risk factors are blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure, that's an important one. Um, if you're starting to develop diabetes or you've developed diabetes, if your cholesterol, in particular your triglyceride or your LDL levels are high, these are risk factors for coronary disease. Um, if you're overweight, um, this, this is a risk factor. And if you have a first degree relative, um, a parent or a sibling who had a cardiac uh, event or stroke under the age of 50, that can increase your risk. So all of those things that you have suggested, um, what if you don't have any of those? If you have none of those, and you know you have none of those because you've been seeing a doctor and that's been checked up, um, it's still important to be aware of the signs and symptoms. And again, not to sort of brush things off. We don't want everybody to become a hypochondriac. But on the other hand, if you are having some persistent symptoms, it's important to always get those rechecked. 
I mean, what do you recommend truly? Like, what do you recommend that we do? What should we do on a daily basis to keep our heart healthy? So, you know, you can't control your genetics. Those right. are things you're born with. Um, but there's a lot of things you can control. Um, the most important ones have to do with your lifestyle. So eating a heart-healthy diet, we talk a lot about it. But it's important to know what that really is. So what is it? And what it really is is a diet that's um, very rich in lean meat, in proteins, uh, low in saturated fats, low in sugars. Um, so you typically are thinking about your food pyramid and working on eating whole grains, lean meats, green leafy vegetables, uh, good nuts, which contain good cholesterol. What are, which are good nuts? Like almonds? Almonds are the best ones. Okay. Oh, good. So I eat them. And you actually will find that on packets when you go grocery shopping or you pick up yeah, it has food a little somewhere. Hard on it. It's a little hard on it, heart healthy. Um, and certain things are really being labeled. I think that um, our producers of food are doing a better job of labeling these things. So it's important to pay attention to that when you shop and when you eat. So if you do take, let's say you take some, some medication for high cholesterol rates, um, does that help you prevent having heart disease? It does. Um, so cholesterol medications and Oh, there are various different types. Um, the most common prescription medication that we utilize to help reduce the risk of coronary disease is statins. Mm -hmm. And many patients are on these now. Mm -hmm. But do they, but they help? They do help. Um, and, and then when you're talking about the, the diets, um, what, like what about things, I know you said no sugar, we're finding sugar mm -hmm. to be an increasing factor in so many different um, diseases. Mm -hmm. So really watch your sugar intake. What about salt? Salt is very important. Um, and we often don't think about salt as much. Um, when we're eating out, we don't control how much salt is in our diet. And so salt directly contributes to blood pressure. So the first thing we usually tell patients when they have high blood pressure is to reduce their salt intake. What is that correlation? Why does salt cause high blood pressure? Salt affects your kidneys and how they retain fluid and water, and so that's how it impacts your blood pressure. Um, are there any new types of testing that are available to determine if we've got, you know, the potential for heart disease? So there's a lot of tests that have been in um, circulation, if you will, in the medical offices for a long time. So there's EKGs, echocardiograms, and stress tests, and a lot of people are familiar with those. Some newer tests that are out there and usually available at advanced hospitals that do uh, cardiac diagnostic imaging, St. Francis is an example of one, um, is cardiac CT. Mm -hmm. A cardiac CT or cardiac CT angiogram can tell you a couple of things. Um, it can tell you what your calcification levels are in your arteries, and that's important to know. It can predict your risk of developing coronary disease. And a cardiac CT angiogram can actually show you a picture of the inside of your coronary arteries to really see how much plaque is in there. You know, I had somebody, a friend of mine recently, who is very healthy, eats fabulously well, exercises all the time, thought was in perfect health, had one of those, mm. the CT scans. There was major blockage and had to have a stent put in without any signs of anything. Mm -hmm. That happens. I see patients like that all the time. Um, you know, it takes a, a significantly tight blockage um, to develop symptoms to begin with. So you can have quite a bit of plaque in your arteries, but if they're not really obstructed, you may not have any symptoms. And sometimes the heart has a good amount of reserve. So a blockage in one artery may not necessarily be felt. And the third thing I tell people is that it's all a function of how active you are. Some people are not active enough to feel the symptoms. Not active enough to feel the symptoms? So an elderly patient, for example, doesn't walk that often, um, may not exert uh -huh. themselves to the level where you would notice um, your a blockage. your beating faster or that you're short of breath or those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Exactly. Is that what you're talking about? That's very interesting. So what is, we get all these kind of rules about how much exercise we should have. And the reality is we don't really need that much exercise a week to be considered doing the right job. No, and I say that to a lot of my patients as well because folks are sometimes very nervous about starting an exercise regimen. People don't always have enough time. Right. And we now in this world of uh, fitness think about exercises, you know, what you see on television or what you see at a gym. Um, exercise could be as simple as a 30-minute walk in your neighborhood where you get your heart rate up a little bit. Right. And what I tell most of my patients is if you can do it three times a week, that's wonderful. If you can do it five times a week, even better. So a 30-minute walk, five times a week where you get out in nature, enjoy. It has to be brisk, though. It should be brisk. Can't be a little stroll. Although a stroll is better than nothing. Stroll is better than sitting on your couch. <laughs> 
<laughs> that it is, and eating sugar. That's exactly right. All right. We're going to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere because we're going to be right back with some final thoughts with more of CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. <laughs> Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. We're continuing our conversation now with Dr. Downing and Dr. Thakor. Let's um, get back to you because you so kindly have rejoined us. Some last thoughts on women and what they should do um, in regards to the, the, the pelvic prolapse. Well, you talked earlier about how common it is, um, and we know that, and we know it affects women as they get older, but the range of women that are affected can be from early as their 30s all the way to their later years in their 70s, 80s, and, and beyond. Um, I think the important thing that I want women to know is that right, there are things that we can do. Um, for some women, it may be expected management, and that's okay. For others, we have non-surgical options like the pessary, and, and for others, surgery is what may be best for them. Um, they don't have to live with it. Yeah, online. exactly, there exactly. Are, there are solutions. That's right. And when it comes to surgery, we can treat them in a minimally invasive fashion. The benefits of that is that there's less blood, so, less blood loss with the surgery, less pain, which means a quick recovery. Um, they may spend a day in the hospital or go home the same day. Mm -hmm. um, and the goal is really getting them back to their activities of daily living as quickly as we can. Yep, and that's a great goal. Yeah. And with you, doctor, I'm just curious about, I know we've talked a lot about the risks, we've talked a lot about women suffering from heart disease and having no idea they have it. If they were to have regular checkups, would it be potentially caught there? I think a regular checkup is the most important thing to emphasize. Um, a lot of women don't get regular checkups, and a lot of women don't go see a primary care doctor. Really? They don't. Um, women, when they're having children during those years of their life, they might see an OBGYN, and we're lucky if they do because, because some of their primary care can be taken care of there. Um, but at the checkup, the most important things that they get are an examination, an ability to share their history with their physician. Many times they'll get an EKG, and the, they'll get blood tests, and the blood tests will check for the risk factors, the development of elevated blo blood sugar or diabetes. Um, if they happen to have a high, high blood pressure, that would be checked at the exam, and their cholesterol gets checked. So it is a really good way to start uh, picking up on the risk factors early and doing something about them. Mm -hmm. Well, and I had a doctor once, who's my primary care doctor, who said, let's go get some further tests. I just want to be sure. Mm -hmm. And so that's always a good thing to, to have done. So women, get those checkups. Exactly. Get those checkups. Make your health your priority. Mm -hmm. Which we don't do. Which we don't do. Would you agree with that? Women don't take their health as seriously or as much of a priority? Well, I think that's related to the busyness of women in their lives and taking care of their families and, and working in their professional lives. And so mm -hmm. it's not because they don't want to, but it's because of all that they're juggling. There's so much going on, a lot of juggling. So women out there, I mean, if you had one final message to them, what mm -hmm. would it be? Women out there, take care of yourself so then you can take care of others. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> <laughs> we all agree. Thank you both so much for being with us today. We really appreciate this vital information that you've shared. And keep up the good work. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much. And as always, for more information or to schedule an appointment at one of Catholic Health Service's six outstanding hospitals, you can call 1-855-CHS-4500 or visit chsli.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jane Hansen, wishing you goodbye and good health.